essentially paying for your gasoline up front. And there are policies that, you know, we're, we've gotten pretty clear confidence from our customers that they will pay that price because we do have a different demographic target. But also, it's really important that, you know, things like fee baits that transition or, or charge a fee for inefficient vehicles and provide a rebate for the most efficient vehicles can help bridge that gap to the consumer to understand that an, it's, it's actually an NPV, NPV positive calculation. So they save money over the time they own the vehicle, but it's hard for consumers to understand that. Is that mostly for commercial, though? Is he's that not, he's com not selling we are compact commercial, cars, yes. though. He's selling a much larger commercial vehicle. Right. So we're not pricing a, a $45,000 uh, vehicle against a, a, a Mazda 3 or a, or a Ford Focus, we're, we're pricing it against a much larger vehicle. The other thing to remember is that when the Tandy personal computer first came out it, it, at Radio Shack, it cost about $8,000. You have to have an opportunity to go down the commercialization curve of this technology. If we can start making them, then we will make them cheaper. So, you know, some patience is required. The automobile started out being a vehicle for the very wealthy or a commercial vehicle, and then it got commercialized. Well, the same thing will happen here. As for parts factories that your constituents might work in, or people they compete with might work in, the single most significant thing this body could do to assist them would be to fix the Chinese currency problem. That is what's moving all these factories over there. It creates an it creates a 50%, 45% subsidy on Chinese exports to this country. What's more, in order to sell cars in China, you have to make them there, and then they make you move your parts factories there. That's what we have to fix. We don't have a free trade policy with China. We have a dumb trade policy. That has to be fixed, or none of this can be fixed. I would quickly like to respond, if I may, to your three questions about infrastructure, spare parts, and green collar training. I'd like to remind the committee that when the Model T Ford was introduced in 1908, there were no filling stations. You had to buy your gasoline at a pharmacy. And so I think it's a chicken and egg situation as these new kinds of vehicles do come into the market, the infrastructure to support them will follow. Uh, when it comes to spare parts, a lot of these new generations of vehicles, which are predominantly electric drive, uh, will require less spare parts. Electric motors and the drivetrains associated with them are a lot m less complicated, a lot more reliable than the traditional internal combustion engine. So your constituents in a few years' time won't be looking for spare water pumps and all of the other things that typically go wrong with older cars. And also, at the beginning of my career, when it comes to green collar training, you, you talked about uh, how Toyota have been, um, have been training uh, and, and been good um, stewards. Uh, I, at the beginning of my career, I watched the British car industry crumble as the Japanese car manufacturers moved into Great Britain, and I saw a sea change in management attitudes as these companies came in. They took far more care to make sure that their new, often uh, green and another sense of the word, uh, f um, vehicle workers, factory workers were, were trained properly and it brought a completely different dynamic. So it's very, very important that the industry um, takes care of, of training its workforces. The gentle lady's time has expired. Um, we just have a few members here. I'm going to, uh, as a result, recognize members for a second round of questions. This is a very important, actually, an, an historic panel in terms of uh, what this discussion represents in terms of what our expectations should be uh, for 15 billion, 34 billion, or as Dr. Marisi is saying, an infinity sign uh, uh, next to the amount of money which the automotive industry is going to request from us. Ex excuse me? It's very big. A big, big number. Um, so let, let, me, uh, let me go down and ask each of you this question. Um, in testimony last week, uh, Mr. Mullally at Ford and uh, Mr. Wagoner at General Motors submitted plans to the Congress. Here's what the plan said. Uh, for Ford, they said that they would make a 26% fleet improvement by 2012. They would make a 36% improvement in their fleet by 2015. Here's what uh, Mr. Wagoner said that General Motors would do for the money, uh, that uh, they would average 37.3 miles per gallon in their cars by 2012 and 27.5 miles per gallon 
uh, for their trucks by 2012. Now, some very smart people at the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council translated these standards into grams of CO2 uh, per mile. Uh, when they did that, they found that these plans actually meet the California standard, uh, which is being debated over whether or not there should be a waiver for California to impose these standards. Um, so uh, that actually translates into an equivalent of 36 miles per gallon by 2015. So the question is, going back to Ms. Claybrook, if they're testifying uh, to the effect that they can meet that standard and they want money from us, uh, and that's what their promise is to us, uh, even if, as Dr. Morisi or others might say, they might try to wiggle out of it, doesn't it make sense to put their promises technologically into the law as the condition of getting the money um, so that at least um, Ms. Clayburg and others can sue them, the NRDC, the Sierra Club, and others, if they don't meet that standard, um, uh, so that they know that there will be some accountability. Uh, let's go down quickly and have each one of you uh, answer that question. President Bush is saying he really doesn't want to go in that direction, but uh, we're going to have a big debate about this in the next 24 hours. Uh, that is the, 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 the question of whether or not we should have these conditions or some type of conditions attached in terms of what the goals should be of these industries from a mandated perspective, given the fact that uh, they're saying that they can meet these standards. Ms. Clayburg. Uh, they should be in the law. They should be in the law. Mr. Munger. In the, law, in, the law, in the law, not in the law. Uh, in the law for, for all companies. In the law for all companies. Good. In the law. In the law for all companies. In the law for all companies. In Dr. Maurice. For all companies, including the transplants including the make sure, make sure that all means including the transplants transplants means the japanese make car manufacturers who operate here the yeah. germans the koreans yeah. all those people that make cars here okay good uh mr waddle i think that uh, yes that they should be included in the law however i think that the standards that uh, the figures that you have just described are um, woefully um, unimaginative for the future. There are companies already that can deliver cars with that c corporate average. Mr. Wardle, you and uh, Ms. Clayburg have already made this point, and, and that's why we have you testify. You are idealists who are testifying, but <laughs> President Kennedy said to people who looked like me when I was 14 years old that our job in politics was to be idealists without illusions, okay. and that's what that 15-foot gap um, between the witness table and, uh, and uh, those of us who are sitting up there represents. And so we try to do the best we can, given the incredible political opposition that is presented by very powerful institutions, including someone who sits in the Oval Office of the United States of America right now. So I agree with your vision. I thank you for it, and I thank Ms. Claybrook. Um, we're trying here to take advantage of a political opportunity as idealists without illusions. And so, yes, I would do more myself if I could, wearing my idealist uh, cap, but uh, I don't have that luxury but, right but now. Mr. I have to try to figure out what we might be able to get done in the next uh, 24 hours or the next yeah. uh, 24 days or so yeah. when we come back and revisit the issue. Mr. Curlis. Yes. Uh, you need to put performance measures in, absolutely. And would you t would you take the performance measures that the industry? Absolutely, itself? that's the way to do it. Now you may want to go back and double check them one more time, but it should be there. And they and technologically speaking, they're going to be able to do this. It's a question of just exactly what vehicles they're talking about and how the mix looks. But in the end, they can achieve this, and those measures need to be in the law. Right. So, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Chairman, yes, okay. Ms. Claybrook. So that's through 2015. But the existing standards go through 2020. So what are you going to do now? The, the existing standards through 2020 are 35 MPG. They say 36 by 2015. So what are you going to do between 2015 and 2020 in the law? Uh, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Ms. Claybrook. I will try to figure that out. Um, but as President Kennedy used to say, the fact that we can't make progress on all fronts doesn't make, mean that we shouldn't make progress on any fronts. Yeah. So let's look at 2015 right now. If we get them to this standard by 2015, they're going to be hard pressed to say they can't go further than that by 2020. Okay. Right now I you're saying, well, right now you're saying that 35 miles per gallon by uh, uh, 2020 is not a good enough goal. Right. 
how about 36 by 2015? You know, we should be, Good. you know, we should be having some consensus that if they say they can do it, that we'll hold them to that. But we know 36 won't be the standard in 2020. We know it will be 38, it will be 39, it will be 40, 41, 42. So we start at 36, and I think that's probably a good way of having this discussion. Mr. Munger. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Marisi. P please forgive me for reversing roles with you, but th then that brings me to the next question, is to what do we do when these guys two years from now saying, well, we're making all these efforts and all these bad things have happened to us, and we ne need yet even more money than you have given us so we can meet these goals that you're requiring of us? Because you know what? The reason they wouldn't want to meet them was not because they wouldn't. They're not inherently evil people. No. But the reality is if the price of gasoline sinks and stays at a, a buck and a half a gallon, then all of a sudden those big pickup trucks start looking good again. And they can make a lot of money. Can I say this, Dr. Marisi? And again, Ms. Claybrook already made this point. I'll, I'll restate it, which is that in 1975, over the objection of the auto industry, we doubled the fuel economy standards from 13 to 27 miles per gallon. Now, at that point, we had an oil crisis. We had another one in 79.80. However, as she pointed out, beginning in 1977, when the rules began to be implemented, um, uh, by the time we reached 1985-86, we had gone from 13 to 27 miles per gallon. Now, a lot of that in the 80s was as the price of gasoline and a, a barrel of oil went down to $12 a barrel. But they were under a mandate, a federal mandate. Now, you say, well, what penalties are they going to have imposed if they don't have any money? All of that, I understand everything that you're saying, Dr. Marisi. But it happened once. And then successfully, they blocked any further increase in the fuel economy standards from 1986, 87, all the way until December of 2007, when my amendment passed, raising it to 35 miles per gallon. Now, that, believe it or not, it had gone backwards to 25 miles per gallon by 2007. So that 10 mile per gallon increase was the best we could do, okay? Now, um, uh, if, if there is a problem in the subsequent years, at least we'll have the law on the books. I, I agree with you. What I'm, what I'm saying is watch out for them to come back and say oh. that you, we need more money to do this. You know. I understand what you're saying, Dr. Marisi. Okay, the, the, the recidivism rate is very high in the auto industry. Okay, <laughs> If that's your point, I've served in Congress. This is my 33rd year, sitting on the very same committee, the Energy Committee. Okay? So I am aware. I have, I'm actually an eyewitness to each one of the hearings that has been held on the subject for 33 years. So I don't think anyone else in the room, with the exception of Ms. Claybrook, can say that. Okay? So that gives me you know, a perspective that understands that I could very much look like Charlie Brown with Lucy pulling the football. But that's why you need a law. Okay? You don't need a promise. That's her point. And you're helping us to say, let's turn the, the promise into legislative language that we then attach and we might not do it this round, but they're coming back again real soon, okay? <laughs> that, I, no, I, again, I, I've watched over and over and over again, okay? The law are actually called for- kid with an allowance. <laughs> you need to attach conditions. That's what we're talking about. And then, that give, I think that empowers, Dr. Marisi, the technologists in the companies. That empowers the younger generation. That empowers uh, the people who thus far have been walled out by the people who went to Harvard Business School. And by the way, I love Harvard Business School. I love the Sloan School up in my district. I love them. They're great people. I'd prefer Don't you though, love the Maryland uh, Business School. I would. Excuse me. Don't you love the Maryland Business, the University of Maryland? I love the School? University of Maryland. I wanted to make School. sure you get that in. But each one of them pretty much gets a three by five card that shows you how you make money. Okay. We're trying to empower the people who go to MIT or to the University of Maryland. Okay. That is the Google boy's father over here uh, at the University of Maryland, uh, who is not in the financial sector, but over here in the technological sector. Okay. Uh, Sergey Brin's father and. You know, and say to the technological people at the University of Maryland or at MIT or at Harvard, now you're in control, you know, because they're going to have to talk to you, the people over at the B School or the Sloan School, huh? as to what you're going to have to now talk about in terms of improving the technology. Right, right now, they just straight on them. They're out of the room. We're not listening to you. you know? We don't have to improve anything. Okay? So that's really what we're talking about right now. How do we create a formula that accomplishes that goal? So, uh, so my, you know, my, my 
you know, my goal here is just to find a way of holding them to what they're saying right now they're going to doing, do like an allowance, okay? There's got to be some penalty. There's got to be something you're going to take away. You're grounded, huh? If you, if, you know, if you don't perform on the allowance, okay, you're grounded for two weeks and then you have to make it stick, right? So we need to find a way of doing that. Um, when, we, uh, when we move uh, 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 forward, you know, we just have to accomplish that goal. I'm just going to ask one uh, more uh, quick question right now, uh, and that is that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Marisi, you proposed that uh, when we provide the assistance to the companies, that they perform the R&D and their first large production runs in the United States. Uh, the condition would be that beneficiaries share their patents at reasonable cost with other companies uh, who will be who will be here in the United States making uh, vehicles. You suggest that this uh, could attract um, producers from around the world and rejuvenate the U.S. auto supply chain. Do you think that people would continue to develop these new technologies if the large profit margin disappeared? Uh, and, um, and I'd like you to just answer that question so that we don't kind of create something that actually doesn't attract anyone to well, uh, that, that fund. That the reasonable has to be reasonable. If you come up with a great idea and it's worth something, the other car companies can have access to it, but they have to pay for it as well. So that, and that worked in Japan. It worked just fine. That's what they did in the 70s and 80s with their technology program. If we require that Americans drive vehicles with high mileage standards and we provide R&D incentives to develop the products here, I don't think we're going to have much trouble getting The reason why I want to do that is I want to get Toyota, Nissan, and Honda involved because we want access to their technology. We want to encourage them to locate more of what they do here. Okay. And, and, and one of the suggestions on the panel was that um, these factories that General Motors and Ford and Chrysler have right now that they might not be using in the future uh, might be made available. I think I heard someone say that to people like Mr. Munger and, and others. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, so that it just doesn't get shut down, but we move it over to the new companies moving in. Was that you, uh, Mr. Wardle? Somebody made that proposal. Yes, I, I certainly believe. So talk about that concept in the, in, the, in the context of Mr. Munger and Tesla and these other new companies. The, um, there is no doubt that, they, that these new companies have already worked out the products that we need. And uh, at the same time, the uh, legacy auto industry certainly has a lot of uh, expertise and capability of turning products into uh, high volume manufactured uh, vehicles. And so I think uh, it would be a, a missed opportunity if some way was not found of harnessing those idle uh, capabilities in the legacy industry to the benefit of the startup companies. So long as none of the um, defensive attitudes, if you like, of the legacy industry uh, would dilute in any way the innovation of the startup companies. So it has to be uh, the right relationship so that the best parts of the current auto industry are made available to the most innovative aspects of uh, entrepreneurial startup companies. Okay, great. And I'll just give you the, the, the quote from uh, the White House press spokesperson, uh, Perino, today as opposed to building the kind of the promise of the industry into uh, the law, uh, she said, quote, today, if the viability advisor says that they're not making progress, then that company, the automaker, would have to pay the taxpayer back right away. So there's the incentive for everybody to work hard to uh, make this work. Good enough for you, Ms. Claybrook? No. Good enough for you, Mr. Munger? It's not obvious how you repay a loan when it's a loan you require. Uh, Dr. Marisi, good enough for you? No, it's not good enough for me. I want more. Okay, thank you. Mr. Waddle, good enough for you? No. No? No. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Mr. Curls was shaking his head vigorously uh, uh, sideways uh, uh, so that you know what his answer was. Let me turn now and recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate the, all of the witnesses and some of the testimony that's been given here. And to my colleague, uh, Mr. Cleaver from Missouri, uh, the Detroit Lions are having a rather tough season this year along with the domestic auto industry. But hey, how about those Red Wings? <clears throat> you know, uh, there's been some talk about the CAFE standards. I think uniformity is key. 
was interesting for us to note. I, I realize we sound a little defensive here again. Interesting to note that Nissan got a loophole in the CAFE standards last time. I am not quite sure how all of that worked out, but I do think uniformity is the key. Uh, and I appreciate, and uh, we are going to see uh, how all of this is going to work when you have various states uh, coming up with their own emission standards. Uh, and uh, as part of the law, uh, it will be uh, uh, it will preclude the auto industry uh, from any litigation uh, trying to stop that. Um, I, I do wonder sometimes. I mean, for instance, if you took a maybe an industry from California, from Hollywood. I mean, if you were a movie maker, and uh, every single state in the union could have their own uh, determination of whether what the rating was on a movie, how would you market that movie? PG in some states and R's and others and these kinds of things. So I, I do think uniformity is the key, but uh, I recognize that uh, there is a bit of a double standard here. But my question would be, uh, and I appreciated some of the comments Mr. Wardle was making about uh, uh, in Britain and the uh, experience that you had there when uh, some of the transplants, as we call them here, came into your country. But it seems to me that our nation has not and our Congress has not done as good a job as we should have of having a manufacturing policy, uh, really, or a comprehensive, cohesive uh, industrial policy. Uh, for instance, in Britain now we see Ford uh, manufacturing their uh, diesel engine, uh, which, which is apparently getting uh, can get 65 miles per gallon uh, there, but yet there was a, uh, a concerted effort to incent people, uh, uh, de-incent them to purchase gasoline and to incent them to purchase uh, diesel as part of sort of the, the country's policy and, and through uh, the EU as well. Uh, I'm just not quite sure who I'm asking this question of, but it does seem to me that if our nation had a more comprehensive industrial policy and a manufacturing policy, we could advantage ourselves in many ways because of this crisis that, that we're finding ourselves faced with now uh, as, as we're busy uh, putting all of these laws and oversight and et cetera. I think we all want the same thing at the end, and uh, maybe we could look at it in a little broader uh, vision of how we can uh, help our country go forward with such a policy. Uh, Mrs. Miller, we have a manufacturing policy in the United States. We have an anti-industrial policy. It is that simple. Whether we have a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, we get the same Treasury Secretary. We get Bob Rubin in one form or another. And the guys from Wharton on up through the Charles River don't know much about factories, aren't much interested in them, and don't really care very much. Okay? And as a consequence, I have watched this body, I have urged, I have written uh, op-ed articles, I have sent you press releases over and over again about our toleration of the Chinese currency policy and how it is devastating your part of the country. And, you know, nothing ever happens. The inability to move on trade policy has done more damage to the manufacturing base in the United States can be possibly a manage, managed by one man or woman, but we have tolerated it. Uh, when Wall Street gets in trouble, uh, you guys passed a $700 billion bailout, which gave them essentially all the money they wanted and then some, and that whatever you don't give them, the Federal Reserve gives them with virtually no strings. They haven't done any of the responsible things to speak of necessary to reopen credit markets, such as reopening the securitization pipeline from good, sound regional banks to fixed income investors. And that goes on and on and on. So we have a policy. My son, somebody said to me, people don't want to study engineering in this country. They're too lazy. They are not too lazy. There's a reason the finance department is full. The same math that is in an engineering textbook or a physics textbook is in a finance textbook. I know. I studied it. But we have lots of kids who want to study finance because that is where the rewards are in our society. And to a large measure, that is a product of public policy. Engineering doesn't pay out because manufacturing doesn't pay out. Manufacturing doesn't pay out because we have a dumb trade policy. I'd like to order. Yes, I, <clears throat> there are, I see a lot of parallels, as I mentioned before, between what happened in the UK and what is happening in Detroit now, uh, largely because of inept management in the British car industry that refused to acknowledge that overseas companies were developing products that uh, UK consumers actually needed. But the, one of the mistakes I think that was made in Britain, which hopefully can be avoided in the US, was that the government intervention in the British car industry was of the wrong kind. What, what we really need here is clear direction and policy from government, which I believe is, a, is something that is always needed, uh, which uh, industry can, uh, can respond to, and which is why I think that uh, 
first of all, we need, this, uh, we need to set up what I would say is a mobility czar to look at this situation rather than an auto czar, so that uh, it's quite clear what kind of uh, transportation future that we have, uh, so that we know what, so, and, and from that to direct policy, so that everybody knows what the hurdles are that they have to uh, jump over or what the parameters are that they have to operate their businesses in. And so uh, it would be wrong to directly intervene with uh, the existing car industry through too much uh, in, in internal messing around, but the, the parameters need to be very clear through government legislation and policy. But that needs to come from very clear oversight as to what are the right answers. And that's something that was never established in the British, uh, in Britain in the 70s. Nobody actually stated what the clear objectives were for the rebirth of the British car industry, so it didn't happen. Mrs. Miller, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to associate myself with both of those remarks uh, and uh, say that I do hope that this committee, and Mr. Chairman, this committee will have a hearing on transportation policy because we actually don't have a transportation policy in this system, in this country, and the, pre uh, the president-elect has just announced that he wants to have a huge infrastructure expenditure. Well, if you're going to spend a huge amount more money on um, <coughs> infrastructure, you better figure out what infrastructure you want and what really makes a difference. We have bridges and roads that are in disrepair, admittedly, but <clears throat> we don't have mass transit systems that go to the airport, for example. A and uh, one of the provisions in this legislation that you're going to be voting on, Section 13, um, requires the auto manufacturers to study whether or not they should get involved in uh, producing mass transit type vehicles, whether it's rail or whether it's uh, you know, urban transit, and uh, as a way to expand the scope and the view of uh, their manufacturing activities. And I would urge that uh, this committee hold some very soon hearings, uh, because the Infrastructure Committee is one of the problems of the Congress. It's divided up. The Infrastructure Committee, that's the public works crowd, is a different committee than the Commerce Committee, which looks at transportation generally. And I would urge both this committee and the Infrastructure Committee to look at transportation policy and what is it that we really want. What makes a difference? People in this country are really frustrated with the changes that have been made by the airline industry because they're in financial trouble. Now you can't get from here to there without going through three different cities in an airplane and changing, changing planes. So there's lots of, of opportunity here for in this middle of this crisis as well, for looking at overall transportation policy. I would just like to make one last comment, Ms. Miller, about something you said about the states setting standards. The reason that advocates like myself have favored that is because the lobbies have overtaken the Congress and stopped any improvement in fuel economy from 1990 when we lost a bill in a filibuster by two votes that would have had uh, by by, 20, uh, by 2001 would have required 40 miles per gallon fuel economy, which would have saved okay. this, this auto industry. Thank you. And, but if I could just say, the, the way that, the, that you can get a, around having it be variable is the manufacturers meet the highest standard. So if California sets the highest standard, then there are not a lot of different standards. You meet the California standards, the one standard. Uh, just one more question with the Chair's indulgence, and I want to pick up on uh, what has been talked about with the trade policies and some of the uh, disadvantages that uh, our manufacturing companies have, uh, have run into as a result of that. And I want to mention about MAG again, and my question is to Mr. Kerr. Curlis, I think it's important to note uh, MAG really was uh, Excello and Cross and a number of various uh, manufacturers that uh, you've consolidated with. And as you mentioned, you're the only remaining U.S. powertrain supplier to the automotive industry and the third largest machine supplier in the world. And yet, if you go into some of the auto plants of the transplants here, uh, the machinery that they use there, do you find any American produced uh, machinery in those plants? Uh, or are they produced in their native uh, nations? And, and if there are no American-produced machineries, ma machinery in those plants, why not? Uh, that's true. Uh, from Japan, the Japanese transplants come here, will not buy MAG equipment. And that's our facilities here in the States, in Europe, around the world. We, we do supply the equipment, though, to people like the Korean transplants here. So, like the Hyundai engine, that is all MAG equipment and they're producing that engine, which is great. That's, that shows that we can do it. 
we, we have the affordability factor to go with putting that equipment in there. But it's very clear the Japanese will not work with us. Now, China is going to be a different picture again. And uh, whether we, that's yet to be decided what's going to come up there. But at this point, um, I would say there's a good chance we won't get some of that business. Um, on the other hand, we get all the, a great deal of business out of Europe. We get strong business through all the other ones in the United States. And then there's the other companies, uh, the heavy equipment suppliers, the, the big diesel engines for Caterpillar and Cummins and, and other companies. And we get all that business as well. So it's just a matter of, of what country you're really talking about, I think, when you're dealing with these transplants. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to express real appreciation for, for you uh, today. Th this has been very helpful to me, uh, although I think uh, uh, Dr. M uh, Meridi sh should come here with a bit more passion uh, <laughs> when you're testifying before con Congress. You should have I was old today, and you should have seen me when I was 35. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the gentleman, you know, I have the third most Italian district out of 435. So imagine a whole district of people like Dr. I, I, I like, I like this. Uh, you, don't, you don't know how much more I just decided to like you. Yeah, it's part of it. So I, I, I'm used to this. This is a normal conversation. It's the way in my we district. are, sir. Yeah. I mean, yes. you, know, you need to eat some more pasta. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, Jose Haywood, uh, said to me uh, yesterday. Uh, he's in the, the, the uh, automobile industry, and he, 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 he's, uh, he sells uh, automobiles, and he said that uh, a year ago he could take 12 applications uh, to one of the financing arms, uh, and he'd get two or three approved. Today he takes 12 and he gets none approved. The, the crisis that we're in now is a credit crisis, uh, and uh, the the one of my complaints with the big three is that even if we give them money, even if we make this bridge loan, they're still going to have a problem because GMAC, Chrysler Financing, uh, and Ford Financing are, are all three requiring a credit score of 700. Uh, yeah, you know where I'm going, okay. Uh, and uh, if there is a credit crisis, with the big three, and they all have financing arms. Uh, Mr. Munger, uh, how in the world are you going to be able to make it without a financing arm? They, uh, if, if we don't figure out a way to put uh, money into the financing arms, uh, the, maybe the industry can manufacture more cars, but the public still won't be able to buy them because there's no credit. And if you are producing uh, uh, trucks uh, with a unit price of $25,000, uh, still, you're still going to have a difficulty. And, a much, and you will have a much more difficult time than the big three. Am I right or, uh, am I right or, uh, or right? Well, I hope that by 2012 our credit crisis has passed. But I think, I think you're, you're very accurate in, in highlighting the issue. Um, you know, Chrysler was actually explicit about the need for, for TARP funds for Chrysler Financial. The, there is a differentiation where essentially the auto industry funds itself out of those affiliated lending arms and they aren't able to lend because they don't have access to capital. They've been hurt by the same things. And so that's why you're seeing them all apply to become bank holding companies or do other actions to activate their access to credit to facilitate the flow of vehicles. So you, you, know, you do have the manufacturing businesses that are losing money, but you, you know, there is need for assistance on the financial side. The risk profile is very different for a financing entity uh, and it's, you know, that's much more of a TARP situation. Well, well where, where will the potential customers come from? I mean, where will they get financing uh, for your uh, vehicles? We have a commercial offering, so it's a totally different financing situation. So, so they'll go to uh, depository banks? They have their own lines of credit, and, and there are some other entities that provide credit to that market. But it, it will still benefit from a smoother, more operating credit market uh, but we have some time to get there. All right. 
Uh, Mr. Water. At the risk of sounding like an idealist, I would point out that we see that uh, there are aspects of future mobility systems where uh, direct ownership of vehicles and uh, access to uh, mobility systems is not, not nece as necessary as it is today. I think there is a good case for looking at, in the longer term, how uh, people can access personal mobility without actually having to make a large loan in the first place through leasing programs or, or, or other forms of um, shared ownership. Dr. Morisi. Uh, yeah, the securitization problem is really at the root of the automobile financing issue. And that is that historically the, the finance companies associated with the Detroit Three made the better loans. They're raising their credit scores because they have less money to lend, so they're just giving it to their best customers. But if we don't solve the securitization problem, we simply will not solve the problem of the automobile industry or the student loan, industry, student loan issue or what have you. Uh, and that has to be solved if we're going to pull out of this recession. It's really not this, I know the scope of this committee, but we need to put conditions on the money we're giving the banks so they'll do this. For example, the banks buying smaller banks does not increase the deposit base. And the deposit base in the United States is insufficient to finance all the auto loans, the home mortgages, and what have you, uh, business loans. It has to be financed by accessing fixed income investors. We haven't imposed those conditions. The Federal Reserve hasn't imposed those conditions. And until it's prepared to do so, we're not going to solve anybody's problems. It's, it's that simple. But I'm hopeful that by 2012, if we haven't solved this, pro this problem by 2012. We're in the soup in a much bigger way than, we, than we've discussed today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I'm going to give each one of you one minute to summarize to um, the uh, select committee and uh, to uh, the nation as to what you think should happen uh, uh, in terms of our automotive industry and its relationship uh, with the, um, uh, the federal government, the taxpayers of our country, and their justifiable expectations. Uh, if they are going to become partners uh, with the big three uh, financially. Uh, we'll go in reverse order of our opening statements. We'll begin with you, Mr. Curlis. Thank you. First off, I want to reiterate that bailout funds need to be made available to the big three. Certainly, for the short term, we have an economic crisis going on here. And a lot of the discussions we've had here today has been about the next generation vehicle and, and the standards and the laws and where do we go for the future and can we get our milestones in and all that. And we, we need to strive for those things. But let's face it, if uh, we keep producing automobiles and there's no one out there to buy them, uh, we're just going to watch that money go down the tube. Not because the automotive companies did a bad thing, it's because our whole economy did a bad thing. And so. We need to look at both aspects of it and maybe do some separation there and make sure that we look at the, both the, long t the short term and the long term. So from, from Meg's viewpoint or from a manufacturing company's viewpoint, we need that, those companies there. We need the big three. We need the volume. We need to see these millions of automobiles being produced, not just 50,000 or 80,000 or something like that. So, I want to encourage us to try to put more tax incentives in, uh, encourage us to provide uh, uh, other types of incentives to, to the entire supply chain that's working with the automotive industry, and let's see if we can get this off the ground as far as looking at the next generation while we solve our economic crisis here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Curlis, very much. Mr. Waddle. Yes. Um, I recommend funding for a powerful, visionary, multidisciplinary commission to define an innovative and far-reaching mobility vision for America over the next few decades. Uh, funding and investment in building a, a far-reaching integrated transportation network across the nation, which a revitalized American car industry could participate in. Um, and financial assistance to help the innovative startup companies get their products to market. And when these, thing, these three, three things are achieved, then we can talk about the necessary financial assistance for the current auto industry as it adapts to a new business model that will support this overall vision. And I'd also like to say that uh, my colleagues and I would be very happy to work with the committee to try and define 
what those requests or uh, initiatives would be to help the uh, so-called little guys in the automotive industry right now. Uh, we thank you, uh, Mr. Wardle, very much, and uh, your Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Back in 1962, when the Beach Boys were singing the little old lady from Pasadena, go granny, go granny, go granny, go, no one could catch her vehicle. Huh? Hopefully, out of Pasadena will come that new vehicle that uh, we, we can be selling so. around the world that, uh, that uh, is, um, uh, is a model for our future, our 21st century, not 100 days, as Dr. Marisi said, but 100 years. Uh, Dr. Marisi. Uh, as a realist and not an idealist, uh, whether we are talking about a bailout or a prepack structured Chapter 11, it's important to provide the industry with the right incentives uh, to create a market here for high mileage vehicles through higher mileage requirements for cars, uh, to encourage the rapid deployment of higher mileage vehicles with a clunker subsidy to make it possible for people to trade in and get rid of the low mileage vehicles as quickly as possible, to provide development assistance for both vehicle manufacturers and component makers uh, and require them to, to share their knowledge with one another Just at a good return so that they are encouraged to continue developing technology and to require vehicles and components benefiting from such incentives uh, to be made here at least in their first commercial runs uh, so that we have an industrial policy that is positive and finally to do something about currency manipulation and Asian trade policies that hurt our industries. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marisi. Uh, Mr. Munger. We're at a unique time where industrial need is aligning with the national interest. It's in our interest to have an industry that builds more efficient vehicles to lead to cleaner air, reduce carbon emissions, freedom from imported oil, and an industry that leads in innovation. It's important to link accelerating efficiency with any bailout that goes along to the, to the Detroit Three. The industry has the skills and the knowledge to do things beyond what they've done to date. There's also existing funding mechanisms in place to help the industry and to help smaller companies achieve those goals. Companies like Bright Automotive are prepared to accelerate this process independently of what's happening in Detroit, but it's important for the nation that we work together, come up with a solution, and achieve a more independent and oil-free country. Thank you, Mr. Munger. Uh, Ms. Claybrook. The microphone, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify. <clears throat> Uh, in the short term, I think that this legislation ought to pass as rapidly as possible, but I would urge uh, the uh, inclusion of a goal for fuel economies we've discussed, and also that uh, the uh, citizens be more involved in this process by being defined as interested parties, because we certainly are. We're the ones who are supposed to buy the vehicles, right? And that, that's the one group that's been left out of this legislation, and also uh, left out our, uh, any requirements for them to take into consideration when they do this redesign, the safety uh, rules that are pending in the Department of Transportation. Uh, uh, the longer term issue, I think, is huge. I think you've got some great recommendations today. I, I agree with uh, preserving the uh, green car factory fund so that it is uh, the full measure of the $25 billion, so that it can support uh, innovative companies uh, such as those that we've heard from today, and that the uh, stimulus package include uh, uh, refunding that, that money so that it's available, and that a transportation policy be looked at uh, in the course of uh, dis discussing the infrastructure uh, future of this nation in terms of transportation, and I think that can only help the, the uh, U.S. auto industry, and particularly if it gets into some of the mass transit issues. And finally, I would say that we need more innovation as well about um, what we do in terms of personal transportation. There have been proposals on the table, for example, to not allow cars into the inner city and to have people jump into uh, free, available, you put a couple of quarters in the box and uh, get to an electric car, and that's all that can come into the city and get rid of some of the pollution. And so it, it, there's an encouragement for people to think themselves differently about how, what kind of car they want and how they use their car. That's going to certainly influence the industry as well. Thank you, and, and we thank each of you. Now, some people are saying, can we do this? Are we being unrealistic? And, uh, and I remember back as the chairman of the Telecommunications Committee uh, back in 1991, 92, 93, 94, when I was introducing legislation uh, to a move from narrow band to broadband. 
uh, the uh, telephone companies, the big incumbents, they said, we can't do it. The cable companies, going to be very difficult. Uh, now, mind you, the telephone companies had already invented the, these broadband technologies 15 years before and had won awards in basic research for their invention, but they had not deployed them yet. And so when finally that law passed in 1996, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, uh, it gave a lot of power. Uh, to uh, people who wanted to innovate because there was a brand new competitive paradigm created in the telecommunications sector. If someone told you that 10 years later the new language would be Google, <laughs> eBay, Amazon, YouTube, and that a younger generation wouldn't know anything but that language just 10 years later, you would have said that's completely unrealistic. But what had happened was there was because of that law an unleashing of innovation, of competitiveness, uh, that created between two and four million new jobs in our country. I'm very proud of that. I think the same thing is going to happen here in the energy and the transportation sector. I think if we get the model correct, we're not going to be trying to put a man on the moon, as Mr. Munger said. The technology is largely there. We're talking about batteries. We're talking about technologies that are much more prosaic than that which President Kennedy challenged us to invent in the 1960s, to put a man on the moon and to return them. So I think that this is a great opportunity for our country disguised as a crisis. Uh, because if we don't meet this challenge in a timely fashion, we will be importing all of these vehicles from India, from China, from Japan, and from Europe. And that would be the tragedy. So we actually have this warning, hopefully in time, for us to change the way in which we view our manufacturing sector and what we can do in order to meet this marketplace of six billion people who look at us as the innovators. We are 4% of the population in the world. The 96% of the rest of the world sees us as the technological uh, giant. That's why they want their children to go to our colleges and our graduate schools, because they think we are the best. We must now meet those expectations. If we do so, then I believe that 10 years from now we'll look back and we will have actually put us on a path to solve the global warming and energy independence issues uh, that we have ignored for an entire generation. It's the kind of advice that you have been giving our select committee today, however, uh, that the leaders of our country uh, must listen to if we had to accomplish that goal. But if they do, I am confident, like we did in the telecommunications sector, uh, that we can empower the Sergey Brins, the, the sons of professors at the University of Maryland, to go out and to reinvent the way in which we communicate. Uh, and, uh, and with that, uh, a final uh, compliment to the University of Maryland. Uh, I, uh, I thank you all for testifying, and uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Yes. Well, I completely agree with you on a lot of the things that you said. Have you done this? Yeah. Not, not, at, no, not at this level. You did a great job. I didn't know David, how are you? Nice to see you. Do you have a card? Write me and I'll join you. If you fell off, it's because there was an accident. Oh, because I did fall.